Welcome to our November program, although it hardly feels like November out there. And thank you to the kitchen for a delicious lunch. Oh, Ren. So I am your president. I am not being impeached. But speaking of that, um, if anyone has any interest in being a board member of Fine Arts Foundation, please let us know because we need a couple of new board members. And uh, I can't be president forever. So I have a couple things to say before I introduce uh, Kathy Ford, who will introduce our speaker. And one of them is apologies about the parking situation here. It gets harder and harder to find a place to park. and there's nothing to do about it so <laughs> that I can figure out. Uh, it used to be you could almost always get parking behind Garrison Theater and put your little card on the dashboard, but the last several times there hasn't even hardly been space in there, so all I can do is say thank you for coming and making your way here. Um, at this point, if you're not an active member, you won't get a postcard in the mail. Only members will get postcards. We're not having a December meeting this year. We decided uh, de December was off. We filled it up too much last year. So the next event will be January 18th, which is our annual member event. We often go see an artist at their studio. This will be a walkthrough of art at the colleges, mostly at Scripps and Ginger Elliott from Claremont Heritage will lead us through and show us um, significant art pieces at Scripps and we'll end up with lunch in the Margaret Fowler Garden. And I think it will be very nice and probably will not be raining. <laughs> so uh, you'll get a postcard about that um, or it will be in the, in the email newsletter. And just to remind you that those member events and Actually, all the money that we raise goes to support our three art scholarships. There's the Fine Arts Memorial Scholarship, the Albert Stewart Scholarship, and the uh, Millard Sheets Summer Intern Scholarship. So we have three different scholarships, as well as we go visit the senior art students in the early spring when they're in preparation for their senior show, and we give them a little stipend check, those art majors. So, there are some little ornaments on your tables that Alba Cisneros has made. Thank you, Alba. So please take one home and trade around if you, someone has something you want better. You can work it out. And then one of our dear friends, artist, teacher, uh, cartoonist, very important person to Scripps College has died in the last, well, Monday, I think. And I'd like to read this little fond farewell to Paul Darrow. Artist and cartoonist Paul Darrow passed away on November 11th, 2019, at the age of 98. One of Claremont's legendary community of artists, he was known for his playful personality, exuberance for life, and immensely creative spirit. There's a little picture here, and I think of that word puckish. You know, he had that smile. He was an elf-like guy. Darrow came to Claremont to study art at Claremont Graduate School after serving in World War II and began submitting cartoons to the Claremont Courier in 1954, which was right as uh, Mar Marty Weinberger bought the paper. And he did it up until last week. Witty and skillful, his sketches reflected the social and political atmosphere of the times, amusing Claremont Courier readers for more than 60 years. Influenced by fellow artist and Scripps professor Sueo Sarasawa, Darrow developed an interest in Eastern philosophy and a spontaneous, intuitive approach to art. He taught classes in painting, drawing, photography, and mixed media at Scripps College from 1954 to 1992 always encouraging his students to embrace the chaos. Darrow relocated to Laguna Beach in the 1970s, 
where he drew inspiration from the coastal scenery for his paintings, mixed media collages, and had numerous gallery exhibitions in the area. We offer our condolences to the entire Darrow family. So now I would like Kathy Ford to come up and introduce our speaker, Christy Johnson, who's going to be telling you about Dora Delarios. Welcome everyone, my name is Kathleen Ford Minor, and I am the daughter of sculptor Betty Davenport Ford. <clears throat> Today it is my privilege and honor to introduce Christy Johnson, but I will start by letting you know that the very first time I worked at the Miller Sheets Gallery down at the fairgrounds in Pomona was in 1977 with Rick Pedersen, who was the, then the director. And I worked on the exhibit that year that uh, featured uh, Guatemalan artisans and their work. And much, much later, I met Christy at the Miller Sheets Gallery in the 90s and had the pleasure of working with her at the Miller Sheets Gallery and then later at Amoca. And I have to say that no one understands what it means to be a ceramic artist more than Christy does. An artist herself, she appreciates and values each step of the process and respects each choice an artist makes along the way. From the conditioning of the clay to throwing or building by hand, to the precise or not so precise aspects of adornment and firing, and the final exhilaration or frustration of the results that firing, of that firing when you open the kiln. Christy gets it more than anyone I have ever known. Christy is passionate, honest, and very effective. She tells it like it is. She is a tiger mother to ceramic artists everywhere. Christy has always fought to tell the true story of her artists, to hold them up so that they may be honored, appreciated, and recognized for their unique contribution. And I realize that many of you in the audience today know, know Christy and know quite a bit about her. But for those of you who don't, I have a few very interesting uh, biographical details. After receiving a BA in English Literature from California State University, Los Angeles, Christy Johnson changed direction, choosing to take college courses in art and ceramics, most notably at Pasadena City College with Phil Cornelius, wonderful Phil Cornelius, and at Otis Art Institute under Ralph Becerra. Johnson is recognized for her lengthy career. She's been working in the medium since 1971 with many exhibition credits, awards, juror assignments, and workshop presentations. Johnson also has 22 years of curatorial experience. While with the LA County Fair, she directed the Miller, Sheet, Miller Sheets Art Gallery from 1990 to 2003. Also, two Beyond the Fair exhibits included a Sam Maloof woodworking retrospective and a Pomona community project entitled Envisioning the Future, a collaboration with feminist artist Judy Chicago. Between 2004 and 2013, Johnson was director of the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Pomona where she facilitated a diverse five exhibition a year schedule. Exhibitions incorporated such well-known ceramic artists as Paul Soldner, Peter Volkos, Rudy Audio, Patty Warashina, and Harrison McIntosh. The museum published books on the latter two artists. A high point of Johnson's time at Amoca was production of a critically acclaimed exhibition and book supported by the Gettys Pacific Standard Time Initiative 
entitled Common Ground, Ceramics in Southern California, 1945 to 1975. Since retiring from AMOCA, Johnson continues to serve as a freelance curator, writer, juror, and workshop presenter. Most important, Johnson has returned to her roots, making exhibiting and teaching ceramics at Creative Arts Group in Sierra Madre. Her current body of work is based on a complex Japanese technique known as Nerikomi. She states, my cracked egg pieces are not utilitarian, but are meant to be appreciated and cherished as part of the decorative arts milieu. I now present to you, Christy Johnson. Welcome. Okay, you guys, <laughs> you're in for a ride. <laughs> um, obviously, we're gonna talk about Dora Delarios, but I have a few um, different roads to get there, which I think might be informative. Maybe many of you know certain histories because you've been here for so long. But for those of you who don't, I think it's uh, a nice review. So, let's see how we do this. It's like I'm operating two things here. Okay, Dora was born in October in 1933, and she died early January 2018. Um, too weak to create with clay, the unstoppable Dora drew and painted until the week before she succumbed to ovarian cancer. At my last visit to the studio, I could see her a uh, shadow behind the screen door. And she said, don't let me scare you. So I opened the door to a bald, hairless Dora. But we had such a wonderful time going to lunch. And um, though she had lost her hair, it, she didn't lose her spirit. Um, she was busy reinventing herself by creating a new business called Irving Place Studio where master ceramists were employed and they used her methods to make uh, dishes and plates and, and certain vessels. Okay, as a newbie potter, I met Dora Delarios at my first Enseca conference. It's the big one that they hold once a year. There's usually five to 7,000 ceramists there. And I was in San Jose, that was 82. And I could not believe, because I knew she was famous, I could not believe that she went around with me and acted as if she were my pal. And I was just very, very honored. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes here. Dora says, my joyful purpose in life has been to create beauty. I have long been interested in the divine and symbolism, mythology, and various cultures. Through my work, I hope to express the unique beauty of the planet. Creating art has never been a choice more than breathing. God gave me this talent. And another thing that was um, said about her, Dora was referred to as an under-recognized artist. She experienced toward the end of her life an acknowledgement that she well deserved. For instance, um, multiple art institutions participating in this Getty-funded project called Pacific Standard Time placed her in a well-deserved uh, spotlight. And three of her large ceramic and wood totems became part of LACMA's permanent collection. I have another quote. quote when I first met her and saw her work in the studio, it struck me almost immediately that it was criminal that an artist of this caliber who had been working this long wasn't better known. But I must admit that that trajectory is increasing. Um, she was um, working at a time where 
women and sculptors were not highly recognized. Okay. Now, it may seem like I'm going off the track, so I thought I'd tell you where I'm going. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a real quick history of clay in Southern California. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Millard Sheets and his connection with Dora. I'll give you some biographical information on Dora. Then I'll show some of her work and in the different themes and types of things that she did. And I will do a little interpretation. I hope I'm right. And, um, and then talk about her belief system and her legacy. So here we go. And I hope I can do this really fast. Uh, when California became a state, mid-1850s, um, everybody was coming here, I guess. <laughs> so um, they, needed, they needed support in infrastructures. So um, the clay was prevalent. There was uh, a lot of it, good sources nearby. And so they made tile and roofs and floors and bricks and sewer pipes. And at the same time, they were making household wear, the things that you needed, like uh, crocks and jugs and um, kitchen wear. So the illustration is a sewer pipe company. OK, and talking about the early 1900s, you're probably familiar with the arts and crafts movement. Started in England and then came to the America and started on the East Coast. And in the end, it finally reached California. We had many California potteries that were making something like arts and crafts. Um, in the 20s, tile became extremely popular for the buildings they were building. And they had kind of a Spanish influence, most of them. Here in the 20s also, um, they were making architectural elements for buildings. And you can see along the roof line and um, these were mostly made in Lincoln, California. So in the 30s, after the Depression, and you had this big dip about building, you couldn't do that much. So the, the ceramic companies turned toward dinnerware. And California demanded a different dinnerware than was on the East Coast. You couldn't have this fine china and in a, in a ranch style house. And so they began to make things that appealed to the population here. So they were colorful and informal and were ready for the patio. And then during the 40s, um, the ceramic companies expanded greatly because we had lack of imports from, from Japan, Germany, and Italy. And there were approximately 900 small potteries in California where they made basically slip cast ware for the uh, trinket or for planters for the florist industry or things that you could put in your home. And that most of them were very trite. I call them kitsch. So um, after World War II, you know, the, the veterans came home, and a lot of building happened in California. I live in a ranch-style house in Arcadia. It was built in about 48. So um, we needed a different type of decor for these houses. Um, excuse me. Sorry. The other thing that was really important at this point is women could buy, and they had their own buying power. They may not have been able to buy a refrigerator by themselves, but they could certainly buy a flower pot. OK, um, Dolores stepped into the ceramic community at about this mid-century time. In comparing the ceramic work shown in the next three slides with Dora's work, it becomes apparent that she did not follow the current ceramic trends or popular styles. So we have here the 1950s. You all recognize Harrison McIntosh up in the left-hand corner. And then um, down at the bottom is John Fassbinder's work. You may have seen it when it was in the Raku shop years ago. Um, 
So some of the work sort of took on that Japanese folk art look, and some took on more of a Danish modern look. Oops, excuse me. Um, this is a little bit before the time that I came in, and I made planters and macrame hangers and soup bowls and coffee cups and all out of stoneware, and I, I paid my dues because that taught me to throw. And part of this thing I attribute to the hippie era, sort of that need to be back to the earth. And then in the 60s and 70s and even a little bit beyond, there was a what they call the ceramic revolution. And that was when figures like Paul Soldner and, and Volkus, and they began to make more sculptural pieces that were um, probably influenced by the painting um, abstract expressionist movement. OK, here we talk about Dora, finally, right? Okay, she was born in Los Angeles of Mexican parents and raised in a downtown area among Japanese uh, neighbors. Her neighbors were both of Mexican and Japanese descent. And her family visited Mexico from time to time since she was six until she was in her 20s. The art that my parents took me to see was of a culture that had created some of the most imaginative sculptures made of clay and also various stones that were carved. The subject matter in both mediums were animals, serpents, and deities who were fantastical in their magical powers. Okay. Here we have a, a, a stone calendar that she saw at the National Museum of Anthropology. And this was her inspiration. Evidently, at six years old, she knew that she, when she saw this that she wanted to be an artist. Um, she received, you like the one in the kiln? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Dora fell in love with clay during a high school ceramics class to the point of becoming obsessed. I think she even got the key to the room and went in there. And um, when she you know, needed to go to the university, she had to have money. So she applied for a scholarship to the University of Southern California. And she was one of only two minority women students in the art department, fine arts department. In 1957, Dora established her own studio and I, in Culver City, and I believe that this is the place where I visited several times and also okay, yes, visited there. And um, she'd have an annual sale, and it was a co-op with other artists, so it was really fun to see and exciting to buy the work. Um, also, I, would, I want you to see on the right-hand side there she is. Uh, this is her method of construction, which started this early, where she would throw pieces for the forms that she was going to do. Okay. So in 62, she took a 13-month trip around the world. And this travel, her studies of world religions and ancient art at USC, her multi-ethnic experiences in LA and her own Mexican heritage led to the formation of her philosophy about human condition. And um, then I say here, you can see the blending and harmonizing of these forces in her body of work. Though her primary influences for her figures and designs were derived from her Hispanic background, one can see hints of Asian, Africa, African or Greek societies as well. I, I should have checked on this before. Can you all hear me? Yes. OK, good. <laughs> good. OK, now I'm going to take this side road here about Millard Sheets. How many know about Millard Sheets? <laughs> Nearly everybody here. So it's not going to be new news to you. So I'll do this rather quickly. Um, 
Here's some of his highlights. He was a child prodigy artist and went to Chenard School of Art in the um, early years, like he was 19 or something. And he was um, known for watercolor and founding of the School of Watercolor in Southern California. Um, then he became a department chair at Scripps, the, the art department. He was a facilitator for the WPA during the Depression. Um, he was an artist correspondent for Life Magazine and the United States Army Air Forces in India and Burma. Uh, then he became a consultant for, a, I said it's uh, Gladdy McBean, but it, at the time he became a consultant, they became known as Interpace. Um, in 52, he began doing um, ceramic mosaics on home savings and loan buildings, and you've probably seen those, and right now they're kind of in danger because people that from Chase Bank or whatever are um, trying to destroy them or think they're old-fashioned painting over them or putting a, a wall in front of them. Um, and his son is trying to rescue these mosaics. Um, after um, Scripps, he became the director of Otis Art Institute, and finally, he worked with Walt Disney in trying to, uh, to set up the Cal Arts, and he was on the board. So he is important to Dora's story because once at Scripps and once at Otis, Sheets appointed ceramic instructors who were instrumental in bringing ceramics to the forefront of the art and craft milieu. Secondly, Sheets organized three significant e exhibitions at the LA County Fair, 6,000 Years of Clay, uh, the, arts of de the Arts of Daily Living, and the Arts of Western Living, all of which influenced the direction of home decor. Has anybody ever been to one of those exhibits at the fair? They consisted of several vignettes that would be the rooms in your home. And uh, artists from the Claremont area, mostly, had commissions to paint and, um, and sculpt and weave and so forth. And then the, the, the people going to the fair could go through that building and get inspired by what they might be able to put in their home. Um, I know that Betty Davenport Ford had a piece there. I think that Paul Darrow had a painting there. We mentioned Paul Darrow as passing away just now. Okay. Um, in his consultant position at Interpace, Sheets established a pilot program for talented young artists to join the architectural tile department. And then a significant to these tile murals that he did um, they were f that were fabricated by Interpace, Dora became connected to that through Millard. Okay. Here, um, you know, when I worked for the fair for 14 years, the big name was Millard. Oh, can't you do exhibits like Millard Sheets? Why don't we have the recognition that Millard Sheets brought to this place? And <laughs> And a hard road to follow, but we did name the Fine Arts Building after him while I was there. It did become a nonprofit while I was there. Um, and uh, the exhibits that I researched, the one that I loved probably most was 6,000 Years of Clay. And uh, they had a catalog, and it was wonderful to see the various people working at that time. And then the Arts of Daily Living, which was covered by House Beautiful in two um, issues. And those issues weren't this little tiny thing. They were thick issues with lots of photographs. And um, all the rooms had different things in it, like I say. But the, the, the ceramics were of real importance. Here you have an example in uh, Jerry and Evelyn Ackerman. They went on to do not only ceramics, but wall hangings and weavings and different things for the home in the area of crafts. Okay, 
So I'm going to go through this thing that's called timing. Okay, I read an article that discussed, this was in Crafts Horizons, one of the popular magazines at that point. And it, the discussion was, why are crafts becoming important in the home? And so I'll try to go through this really quickly, but I found it fascinating because everything was set up for the potters to be able to enter and become career artists. And in particular, for Dora. Um, OK. There's a desire for social status. Wait a minute here. I'm starting in the wrong place. Oh, OK. There was an advanced society that was seeking purchases not based on need or comfort, but on subjective desire. Great number of people with disposable income at that time, large and expanding middle class, uh, work, I mean home, not work, nor the car, became the determination of uh, one's social condition. The feeling of permanence and security made collecting defensible. As opposed to World War II, the mentality was a desire to nest. Um, need to make the home a place of contentment or statement, and the purchase of arts and crafts, one of a kind or few of a kind, ensures the expression of individuality. Okay, so there was a desire for social status, a need to juxtapose the handmade against the modern things made by machine, uh, chrome, plastic, industrial materials, etc. Crafts became the antithesis of dehumanization of product. Increase in higher educated buyers contributed to knowledge, exposure, and good taste. And this is a phrase used all the time by Sheets, good taste. Um, buyers looking for better taste, better quality, and evidence of human hand. Popularity of, per of crafts, particularly pottery, women's buying power, which I've mentioned, and, and top decorating magazines and books filled with articles and advertisement experienced a great increase in readership. And that, if any of you remember back in the LA Times, they used to have a home magazine. I used to cut those out and save those things. I thought they were wonderful. I wish I had saved them. <laughs> um, so, and then also Pasadena um, had their California design shows at that time, and they put out great catalogs. So in 62, this is when the, uh, the pipe, joint pipe, and uh, Gladdy McBee merged. And here you have the artists that were chosen. Okay, in 63, Dora Delarius was chosen for an artist in industry program overseen by painter Millard Sheets. She and 12 others uh, were chosen for this artist in industry program. She um, and the others were hired to work for Interpace, formerly Gladding McBean, and Dora worked in the tile design and um, other people that you might recognize are Harrison McIntosh, Jerry Rothman, and Henry Takamoto. And those were four that did the tile designs. So the headquarters for Interpace were, it was located in New Jersey. And in the lobby, they had this very large mural and Dora had a hand in that. Um, just a second here. She recalls having to sit in a basket and being lifted up to see the mural in progress. So she did, um, she headed up six murals for Disney World. And then, um, Interpace came to a point where tile was not in big demand. And so they rented out the space to artists, and among them was Dora. So she began constructing murals of her own. 
Uh, these are two examples, uh, one in Hawaii and one at the Lowry's um, Center. I don't know if that still exists, does it? It does. It does. Okay. Um, here's a couple of her commissions for libraries. And then this is one of my favorite stories. In 1997, Dora received an anonymous request to make 12 sets of dinnerware. Later, she learned that she was one of 14 potters who were selected to make place settings for a Senate wives luncheon at the White House. It was hosted by Joan Mondale, wife of the then Vice President Walter Mondale. Joan was a strong proponent of the arts and crafts and was herself a potter. The small, oh, okay, the image at the bottom, that small plate there, I own it. And <laughs> I bought it in her studio in Culver City and um, at one of these big sales that were so important. And this, though it doesn't really look like the other plates that ended up there, I know that she told me it was a prototype, that she was doing some experimentation on some of these plates she had to, for sale. So I'm very happy that I have one of them. And I also have one that belonged to Catherine Hirsu. So I have two examples. <laughs> I, I love collecting ceramics. I have one room in my house that has over 300 pieces. <laughs> now, none of them are large, because I've never had the money or the space for anything very large. But it's a taste of all these different people and it's, they're my treasure, okay? All right, now, let's see here. Am I doing on time? Am I, I'm gonna run out of time, huh? Okay, the variety of work. So you're gonna see some of this. Functional work in the very beginning uh, here's more functional white work when she began to learn how to inlay black into white porcelain. <coughs> she did animals, and I, I mentioned that she throws the parts on the wheel and then puts them together. Um, more animals. And, and you should note that there's a humorous sort of note to these, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> And then she did people, and maybe these were made when she had her daughter, Sabrina. And then um, some of the human forms that she did. Uh, I'll talk about the one on your left a little bit later. But the king and the queen um, are really good examples of what she was doing. So along comes Christie to the LA County Fair. And um, in 2002, I put on an exhibition um, about sculpture. So it was carved, chiseled, cast. And that is the front of the catalog at that time. Um, the other recognizable piece in this photograph is of the statue that's on the steps of the, the gallery on the fairgrounds, which is in disrepair very much in disrepair, but it was made of cement. And the front of the catalog shows the, uh, Lawrence making, Lawrence Tenney Stevens making this cement sculpture. Old photographs, I wish I had those. Um, so these are the people that were in that show. And again, the most important one to me was Dora, because I asked her to be in it, and she said yes. Where other times I experienced artists who said, the LA County Fair, no thank you. You know, so she was very kind to me. She was also instrumental later on in getting me a uh, show at what was called the MOA Gallery, M-O-A, and it was in, um, in Los Angeles. It's no longer there, but that's what, one of the things that she did for me. So the ones that you might recognize are Albert Stewart, John Svensson, Betty Davenport Ford, um, Barbara Baratage, Alto Casanova, so, oh, and maybe Jack Zajac. So those were um, local people that I showed. Um, interestingly, one of the board members asked me, is sculpture part of the mainstream art? 
I thought, what are you doing on the board? Help me. <laughs> but it, it's real, you know, maybe people don't know that sculpture is part of art. But I bet all of you know, right? Okay. Okay, this is um, uh, one of her murals and the first one that I've seen that, that contains gold leaf. Let me catch up again. Okay. And this was probably one of her most ambitious works. And I visited her studio when she was making this. And she made um, sprig molds for the fish. So she made the mold, pushed the clay into it, released it. And she was paid quite handsomely for this, which meant that she could buy some additional equipment for her studio. And uh, this is when she had moved her studio to Venice Boulevard. And um, there we go. I guess they tore down the place in Culver City, or they quit renting it out, so she had to find another space. So the thing that I did not recognize at first was that Dora worked in many materials other than clay. I think clay is her primary, but here we have in, um, in Japan, uh, a cement, cast cement wall, and on the right hand side, a bronze figure. Um, the variety of, mat of materials in included um, in this fountain, um, brass and cement and tile and uh, a fountain. And then on the right side, sort of these whimsical wooden toys. When I went to the um, Contemporary Arts and Crafts show in Santa Monica, going through and seeing everybody, there was Dora. And here she was with a lot of mirrors in her little booth. They had clay frames, but they, m the majority had wood frames. And that was like, what? What are you doing? Because I really didn't recognize her for any of these other mediums. So that was a, a rude awakening for me. Um, now I'm going to talk about the themes. Um, here's some of her whimsical pieces. I love the one where she's at USC, where she's putting all these figures together. Um, here's, a, here's a way that she combined both uh, a functional piece with sculptural elements. Um, she was keen on mythology, so you see here that the, the one that's called the six-legged center, I don't, it's supposed to be a human face with an animal body. I guess so. And then the mermaids on the right side. All right. OK, this was actually taken during an exhibition. And um, the figure on the left is an ancient burial sculpture, polychrome ceramic made probably between 200 BCE and 500 CE. Um, and so her piece next to it, called The Warrior, um, shows a, a resonance between her past and the present. Um, and the piece on the right is kind of referencing some of the dogs that were buried in the, in this, in the area. Um, they were unglazed and highly burnished, and they were chihuahuas. All right, I'm going on to symbolism. On the left is a mandala, the spirit symbol of Hinduism and Buddhism, Buddhism, and it represents the universe. Also pictured are totems often associated with natives of the Pacific Northwest. Totems can be spirit beings, sacred objects, or symbols of a tribe or clan. Uh, showing you a couple of masks. She got inspired by the Craft and Folk Art Museum put on a mask show in LA. And so she decided to participate or was asked to participate and she began making masks. She did this for quite a while. And this one I showed at the American Museum of Ceramic Art. 
during um, a show called Ceramica de la Terra, and it was in 2009. So again, here I'm making another connection. All right, physical features. It's often said by collectors of Dora's work that there are similarities to various different cultures. They're not all Hispanic looking. Some of them look Japanese, or I like the ones with the long necks because I think that's like Africa where they put all those rings around your neck and stretch it. And so some of the uh, collectors say, I can't decide if it's Japanese or Hispanic. Then the Asian influences, and I mentioned before that she lived among Japanese gardeners in LA during her childhood. And so here's a couple that I think show the influence. Uh, Catholicism, again, maybe I'm stretching it, but I don't think so. Uh, on the right, I'm on the left rather, the koi goddess is all this um, gilding. Um, and on the right, I think those look a lot like stained glass. And goddesses. Goddess was a big theme of Dora's. She produced a great number of female sculptures with the word goddess in the title. As a woman, Beginning her career in the late 1950s, Dora faced the world where all decisions appear to be male-dominated. The feminist movement of the 1960s impacted many women artists. Dora knew from her college courses and extensive travel that ancient cultures had women as decision makers, and they were viewed as the protectors of the home and of wild animals and were honored with portraits in marble. The goddesses of the ancient world represented the fountainhead of creativity and divine female energy, a compelling icon for a contemporary woman. So according to, her, to Dora's daughter, Sabrina, she was not a, a feminist when she did these. But she was very aware of woman's place in the world. And this became part of her spiritual uh, connection. These women, these, these women, uh, kind of ancient women. And they were done in all media. They, um, some of them, I think, had kimonos. If you look at the one on the left, that has, to me, an Asian influence in the costuming. So then I met at MOCA, and we produced a show along with the Getty called Pacific Standard Time. And we did a book on it. And um, it was called Common Ground Ceramics in Southern California, 1945 to 1975. Anybody see that show? Yes. Yeah. The book is still there, so if you want to bone up on some history and read about Dora and others, uh, most of which you'll, you'll recognize their names, I think, if you have anything to do with clay. And it's an interesting, it's done, um, there were six authors, and they each took a section and talked about experiences with um, Gladie McBean or uh, experiences with other collectors of that time, and uh, I, I loved the, all of it because I got to research and write and, and um, help produce the book, and my daughter designed it, so that was really fun. Okay, here they are, Dora and uh, her, her daughter, Sabrina. So I'm gonna read something here that, I, um, Irvine Place Studio was founded in the summer of 2012 by Dora, her daughter, and son-in-law, who after Dora's passing continued to run the operation. The Los Angeles studio makes finely crafted wheel-thrown tableware that can be ordered online. And right now, they're in production of a, for a huge week-long celebration 
it would be worth a trip or at least to see it online and see what um, they have done in honor of her mother. So it's an exciting ending, I think. Um, did I make it? Not quite. It's a little long. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yes, please. If you have questions. Did, did I cover all of it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Kathy. Yeah, one question. So the holiday bazaar that she's preparing for with all the fireys, are these things that are available to the public? Can you go there for this bazaar? Okay. Yes. And I, I believe there's other locations that are participating in this. On, on Venice Boulevard in L.A. It's, um, all right. Thank you for having me. It's been fun.